Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. So basically, in, in doing that, more specifically, right at the beginning, what I want to do is just give you some, some brief information on how this particular body of work came about. And uh, the majority of this work is primarily from 2018, but some of the earlier uh, earlier parts of it go back to uh, 2016. So it was during that summer, um, you know, it was one of those situations where I hadn't been in the studio for a while. I was really sort of just looking about and a little bit lost with uh, what to do with the work at that time. And one of the things that uh, was starting to eat at me a little bit uh, more than anything else was just, you know, that just the whole process was getting a little too predictable for me. And by that, what I mean is that I was starting to become a little too comfortable with the images and the paintings I was making at the time. Um, compared to the paintings that you're looking at now at that particular point in time, um, the format of them was very fixed and much more geometric. And the one constant in my work, easily for over the last 40 years, has been these very isolated, centralized, iconic type of shapes, primarily silhouettes. Uh, it's the one thing that I've worked with more than anything else. Um, and so doing, part of the problem of that mix is uh, the whole idea or process of how to do the same thing differently. You know, when you finally accept the fact that this is what you do, which took me almost 20 years of not, you know, of constantly trying to fight with that, uh, the second 20 years, I've tried to figure out exactly what to do with that in a lot of ways. Um, it's sort of the good news, bad news, you know. The good news is I make centrally isolated, iconic silhouette images. Therein lies that's also sometimes the bad news. So, in that frustration, uh, over the summer of 2016, and just trying to get the process, I hadn't been in the studio in about six weeks, and I was just trying to get the process going again, and sort of figuring out, okay, where am I gonna take this? What am I gonna do to sort of shake this up a little? And uh, inadvertently, I started going through and cleaning out flat files, and in, and in so doing, I took out a, a series of paintings that I did in the mid-90s, uh, paintings on paper, that started as a process that uh, I was on the road six months out of the year. I was trying to figure out a way to make work in hotel rooms. So it came out of very much of a need of how do I get work done when I'm away from home and away from the studio. So small scale, limited number of pigments, basically doing ink drawings uh, when I was on the road. It was sort of what was going on at that time. And then when I'd get back home and have a little more time in the studio, I'd add color to them and uh, push the images a little bit more. So I had that stack of work out while I was still working on the images for 2016. Um, and curiously enough, I you know, over the course of a few weeks, I tacked a couple up on the wall. So peripherally, they were always sort of in my, you know, in my vision. And uh, one day I came in and just, I pulled one off the wall, I set it down on the table, the drafting table that I work on quite often. And I just ended up taking the X-Acto knife and cutting that silhouette that I always work with. Cutting that particular shape out of the, the work on paper. And I overlaid that and just set it on top of a painting I was currently working on from, uh, from 2016. So what happened, and eventually where that took direction, was that inadvertently this, this hybrid came up of paintings 20 years apart. But visually, I really liked what was happening because it switched the whole figure ground relationship for me. It switched what happened with the silhouette. Um, so I spent the majority of that summer, I had well over a dozen to 15 of those paintings. I'm literally cutting those things apart and cutting them up and, and you know, collaging and gluing down over paintings from 2015. So uh, my body of work was condensing almost immediately, which uh, in a lot of ways was it was just kind of funny and ironic, you know, because after you've been painting for almost 40 years, uh, something that's sort of a constant source of, oh shit, what am I going to do now? It's just, you know, issues of storage and issues about painting certain scales and all those kinds of things. And uh, for me, it was very circumstantial that uh, I ended up painting on, the, on panels and working on this scale again.
because it came about through a friend of mine in Boston. When I moved from, I mean in Baltimore, when I moved from Baltimore to New York in 2009, a friend of mine there wanted to do some uh, collaborative pieces, and he sent me these panels to work on, and, ever, and I've been working on them ever since, to the point to where the last couple of years almost exclusively, 90% of the body of my work is done on this scale. So hopefully that sort of gives you a little bit of an idea on background. And a lot of the, some of the compositional elements, especially what's happened at the top and bottom, on the, on the bottom and top of these images, is strictly a reference to mistakes that were taking place with gluing those paintings on paper on top of you know, the current panels I was painting and working on at that time. In the sense because they were just they were different sizes. So inadvertently, this the stripes started to appear at the top and bottom of the compositions, which visually for me was quite unsettling, but kind of in a good way. I mean, I kind of like what started to happen with the space, and that sort of carried over. Because once I went through that series of paintings on paper and cut those all up, I now had to kind of figure out, well, how's that going to carry over just into pure painting now, where you're not collaging anymore, you don't have these elements to cut out, and how are the mechanics of that going to just transfer in to doing pure painting. And that's essentially what this body of work has been about. And, you know, what started, what's come out of it, come from. Um, yeah, so um, there's a few things that come to mind immediately uh, when you referenced um, the figure ground at this small scale. one seems to be its own unique um, shape. Like in the room, they are their siblings and cousins, but there aren't you know, duplicates, likewise, for the, the surfaces around them. And I wondered if you could just explain it or talk to the um, where the shape originally comes from, which I actually do know, some of them. But some of them know not at all, and I think that would be useful. And then the other is to um, describe just a little bit the choice for the um, the intermediary white ring on many of them. Okay. Um, I'm starting to get confused with the starting points. Uh, the shapes themselves, I wish. You know, I was a little more sophisticated about my selection process or what have you, but the, the most immediate, the easiest way to get to that is that it has a lot to do with what I refer to as whether or not the image has any firepower. Um, and by that, what I mean is that when you work with silhouettes, especially earlier on, like work I was doing you know, 10, 15 years ago, where I was just really working with these very flat silhouettes, the flatness of the surface was very important to me at that time. I wanted something that was, you know, relatively evocative. When you're working with something that's that reductive and that pared down and that spare, visually it had to do something on, you know, on a certain level. Um, at one time, it was the mechanics of a shape and what it referenced for me. For a number of years, um, in the early 2000s, I got a residency at Evergreen House at Johns Hopkins, which had a wonderful library. Uh, Evergreen House was connected to the Garrett family. And John Garrett had an exquisite library of, of Audubon books and uh, 17th century, 16th and 17th century Italian naturalists. So at that time, I just came across a lot of these insects images that just really you know, stuck out in my mind. And it had a lot to do with things that just had appendages. So therefore, that just tied into me to certain types of mechanics and abstract painting. Uh, for instance, you, know, you look at somebody like, Franz Klein, who's often been referred to as do, doing broken furniture paintings. Well, on that notion is that it was the thing, you know, that construct, the formal quality of those paintings is, you know, broken furniture. There's still arms and appendages sort of sticking out from the central shape. So that's why those particular, at that particular time, those insect images stuck in my mind. I've gone through a number of different series, you know, since then, but 
or the more immediate work, there's a primarily there's two or three main sources that a lot of these images come from. One of them is trips to Costa Rica, where the plant life and this overabundance of people who are very very much into you know self self sustained uh, environments in people who either, it's a very agrarian society a lot of the folks that live there people are either working as you know fishermen or they're, they're, they're raising vegetables raising animals but one of the things that fascinated me more than anything else was just the simple ability to where if you don't have a tool you make it so there's like there's a lot of these little handmade objects and gadgets for wrapping you know fishing line around or for tying a boat up or trellises people would make for supporting vines and you know, like cucumber plants and that kind of thing. Just a lot of this handmade stuff around. And these things just stuck in my head. And sometimes simply because of the shape or, you know, plant life growing up through a trellis, which will eventually, this will get into conversations that I've had with a number of these folks before about organic and geometric forms combined and how that came about. But that was another thing about that environment that really stuck out in my head. So, um, there's just a lot of associations that come with that kind of imagery. Uh, one of the other sources most recently is uh, over, over a year ago, my wife and I bought a place down in Delaware where we've gone every summer for the last 20 years or so. And uh, it's close to the coast. And this one area where I go a lot um, is, a, is an inlet from the bay system out into the Atlantic that sailboats and commercial boats go in and out of. And something that I saw over and over again, because now I have the good fortune of going down there for extended periods of time, as opposed to just going down there for a week or two every year. And uh, so these things that I saw in my periphery uh, for a number of years this past summer became very resonant because I saw them on a more regular rotation. And I was just seeing boats going in and out and the raising and lowering of sails, as well as this campground that was close by people erecting and deconstructing tents and poles and canvas and that kind of thing and then also guys fly fishing and just the type of line qualities you saw that line on school it's just you know I'm simply talking about things that get buried in my brain that eventually have to come out sometime uh, like I said I wish you know sometimes I feel like wow that's not very sophisticated but you know I uh, it's just the way the images work for me. And, you know, I sort of sort through them and fool around with them because sometimes, you know, when they first come out, they're extremely clumsy and I don't, you know, they don't quite feel right or fit right to me or just, you know, have kind of the, the right physicality to them. So they'll rotate in and rotate out until, you know, I start to get things that start to happen on the, on the painting surface that really appeal to me. 